tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. It's another special day here at Casa de Blood. It's National Hanging Out Day. Apparently, it's supposed to encourage you all to hang your laundry instead of using the dryer. But that doesn't sound much like a holiday to me. So we're just going to hang out. How's about that? Old Chester's always up for a hang. Good thing, too, because we've got a good one for you tonight. I mean, a damn good one. Come on in, friend. Mm. All right. You know, when I'm hanging out with my pals, we're always talking about SimplyScaryPodcast.com. <laughs> There's this patron thing where you can get our whole catalog dating back to 2012, ad-free and available to download or stream. Only $5 a month, can you believe it? Cheaper than your dryer bill. When you think about it, it's fabric softener for the soul. Our story tonight needs no hokey salesmanship. Brian Asbury is back with a tale of good-natured naivety and denatured revenge. So without further delay, I give you from author Brian Asbury, Waken the Dead. There are roughly four types of people in the pen. The majority are your run-of-the-mill thieves and drug addicts. Then there are those who fucked up once, but it was bad enough to land them behind bars. Murderers often fit into this category. At the bottom of the food chain are sex offenders, an inmate generally regarded as scum by everyone. And finally, there are guys like Francisco Padilla, career criminals who've perfected the art of lying and manipulation. Drug dealing was his specialty, but he also dabbled in carjacking and credit card fraud. His lifestyle had earned him quick money through the years, but also several lengthy prison terms, an estranged son, and a slew of toxic relationships. He sat on his bunk reading The Art of Intrusion and listening to music. His old Zenith boombox that he had since he was first locked up reflected the amount of time that he had spent behind the walls. It was an existence that he had become all too familiar with. At movement time, he made his way down the corridor to the gym. His lifting partner was Randy Gaines, but he went by the name of Looney. He was a large, imposing man with a long, dark brown ponytail. His gaze was icy and expressionless, almost as if his eyes could see all the way through a man to his bones. The two grew up in the same neighborhood, and although Looney was white, he spoke and carried himself as if he was a cholo. He was a member of the Northside Kings and had connections to the Mexican syndicate. He would traffic heroin and methamphetamines for them, but he also operated independently, and this is when he had been known to get sloppy. He'd recklessly mix in random substances such as fentanyl, rat poison, synthetic bath salts, and just about anything else that could be used to increase profit margins. Quality control doesn't exactly exist on the black market. Looney stood in the gym, curling a set of dumbbells as his hands shook with a slight tremor. He sat the weights down and shook his head. My meds are fucking with me again. That psych doc has me on enough shit to tranquilize an elephant with. Cisco just laughed. <laughs> well... Whatever the fuck your dose is, they need to up it. He did a few sets on the bench press while Looney spotted him. After he racked the weight and sat up, Looney looked down at him. That fucking paisa keeps looking over here. They keep grouping up and trying to take over the weight pile. Fuck him, Cisco said dismissively. You gotta quit worrying about that kind of shit. We gotta stay focused and under the radar so we can get the hell out of here. 
I don't want to fuck that shit up over some bullshit prison politics. Looney's hand trembled madly as he fought to control his propensity to violence. Pinche cabron. He hissed under his breath as he slid under the bench for his set. Pretty soon, an announcement could be heard over the loudspeaker. Gym is closed. The gym is closed. Return movement at this time. Cisco shook Looney's hand. See you at Chao Primo. Looney nodded and lurched toward the exit. After everyone filed out of the gym, the recreation officer opened the porter closet. Cisco stepped inside and grabbed a dust mop. He pushed it across the basketball court like he lived his life, careless and half-assed. He picked up the dirt with a dustpan and swept the remaining debris under a bench. A little while later, he wiped down the machines with disinfectant. In one of the corners of the gym, just outside the view of the cameras, he stood speaking with another worker. He looked around, and when the coast was clear, he pulled out a tattoo motor that he had stuffed in his waistband. The other worker lifted his pant leg and removed two cigarettes from inside his sock. The two exchanged items and shook hands. Sisko then grabbed his rag and continued working. On his way to the cell, he stopped by the unit office and checked the mail list. To his surprise, his name was highlighted. Mail for Padilla, he said to the officer behind the desk. The officer dug through the mail folder and handed him a letter. When he got back to his cell, he changed his clothes, then sat down at his table and tore open the envelope. The letter inside read, Dear Francisco, my name is Victoria Calloway and I'm writing to you after registering with the Broken Chains Inmate Pen Pal program. Where should I begin? Well, I guess I'll start by letting you know that I don't judge you or whatever circumstances may have led to your incarceration. I myself have experienced the trials and tribulations in life. I served a few months in jail many years ago for a drug offense and never forgot what an isolated and lonely experience it was. To make matters worse, I didn't have many family or friends to rely on for support. I'm now 47, sober and currently married, although it's not much of a partnership. My husband's in his late 50s and paralyzed from the neck down due to a car accident that he was involved in several years ago. Most days I feel as though I love him, but I don't always feel as if it's mutual. One day I saw a flyer at my church advertising this program and I couldn't help but think that the Lord was speaking to me. After getting online I saw your bio and realized that we have a lot in common. After much praying I decided to take a chance and write to you. I'm just looking for a friend much like yourself. I hope to hear back from you soon. May you have a blessed day. Sincerely, Victoria. Cisco sat the letter down and sneered. He lacked support from the outside, so having someone like Victoria could potentially mean money on his books, or maybe some raunchy photos if he could talk her into it. Looking to capitalize on this opportunity, he grabbed a pen and a writing tablet. Dear Victoria, congratulations on turning your life around. Your story gives me a lot of hope. I do want something better for myself than prison. When I was released this last time, I was working construction and doing good. I made the mistake of getting caught up with a woman who I believed loved me. The truth was, she was less than honest, and I ended up paying the price. To make a long story short, she was on parole and had drugs and a loaded weapon in her car when we got pulled over. I was also on parole and ended up taking the fall for her. She vanished shortly after I got locked up. I can relate to you when you mention the loneliness that you experienced in jail. Sometimes it's almost unbearable. So much so that it led me to seek out a pen pal. I spend most days working, attending classes or going to church. I'm also a Christian and my faith is what keeps me going. I look forward to learning more about you and maybe getting a photo if it doesn't cross any lines. Talk to you soon, Cisco. The truth was, everything that Sisko had written was lies. And despite the small faded cross near his thumb, there wasn't a religious bone in his body. The words sounded good though, and it would eventually lead to another letter. Then another one, 
and soon Cisco would add Victoria to his phone list. This is a call from a person currently incarcerated in the Colorado Department of Corrections. All calls are logged and recorded and may be listened to by a member of prison staff. If you do not want to accept this call, please hang up now. The automated message said, Victoria gripped her phone nervously as she waited to hear Cisco's voice for the first time. Hello, Victoria? Cisco? Yeah. It's so wonderful to finally hear your voice. Cisco played on her empathy. It's just nice to hear anyone's voice at this point. People sometimes forget about you when you get locked up. The two talked until Cisco's phone time ran out. Victoria explained the situation that she found herself in with her husband. He was involved in a head-on collision with a semi that left him paralyzed and suffering from a traumatic brain injury. He received a large settlement, large enough in fact that they were able to upgrade their home to a sprawling single-level rancher that was built to accommodate his physical restrictions. But despite the money, their marriage had become strained. Her husband Kenny's personality had changed following his accident. He had become demanding and unreasonable at times, and she was forced to change from a wife to a caregiver. To cope with her growing discontent, she immersed herself in the church. Sisko sat on a wrought iron bench as cops played on the day hall TV. He smiled and flashed a picture of Victoria to Looney, who sat next to him. That the ones you've been talking about? Looney asked. Yeah, I can read her like a nursery rhyme. She's married? Not happily. Her old man's in a wheelchair. Looney studied Cisco as he stared at her picture. Look at you all giddy and shit. You like her, huh? I've been doing six years on this stretch. Cisco motioned with his head to a gay inmate who was doing another one's hair at a table across from them. At this point, even that hotel's looking good. Looney turned to look, then put his head down and snickered. I'll tell you what I really like. The fact that her dude's sitting on a million dollar settlement from his accident, and she's the beneficiary. Cisco sat on the floor with his back resting against the cinder block wall as he spoke to Victoria on the day hall phone that evening. So, any big plans for this weekend? I'll probably go up to the Garden of the Gods on Saturday. I go there just to clear my head sometimes. I used to try and take Kenny, but it's just gotten too hard with the wheelchair. That's a very beautiful area. I spend many summers fishing up there. You like fishing? I love it. I'd go up in the morning and come back after sunset. Me too. My dad used to take us fishing up at Lake Isabel all the time. Cisco smiled to himself. Hmm, <laughs> maybe one day we'll get to go together. Victoria smiled back on the other end of the phone. Maybe so. He paused. So, how would you feel about coming to visit me? Victoria stammered. Well, uh, how would I go about doing that? It's just like when I added you to my phone list. They run a background check and once you're approved... You can come see me. Victoria smiled bashfully. Okay. Well, what info do you need? Cisco grinned triumphantly and grabbed the pencil and notepad from his shirt pocket. A little over a month had passed. Cisco was dressed in his best prison greens as he nervously tapped his foot and gazed out the window into the prison's parking lot. Pretty soon, the moment he had been waiting for finally came. A large bus pulled up. When its doors opened, visitors filed out and gathered next to the gate. When it opened, they walked in a single file line towards the visiting room. When Victoria walked in, Cisco's eyes opened wide, and he motioned to her with his hand. She walked up to him, and they hugged. Then he looked at her, seemingly overcome with emotion. I'm sorry. For what? I probably shouldn't be saying this, but you're even prettier in person. She smiled modestly. Aw, oh, well, thank you. They both sat down with their smiles still intact. Victoria shook her head. Kenny thinks I'm at a Mary Kay party with some of the girls from church. She sighed. I hope the Lord forgives me. 
They still have those. I think so, she said as she cringed. Sisko looked around. Well, this is home, for now. It's actually not as bad as I'd pictured it. Not that I'd want to be in here or anything. I'm definitely not proud of it. I do have some good news, though. Oh, yeah? What kind of good news? A beaming smile overtook Sisko's face. I made parole last week. I was just waiting till today to tell you. Victoria perked up. Sisko? That's wonderful. I know. I've hardly even slept. I'm so happy for you. Sisko's smile then diminished some and he sighed. And there's just one problem. I have to figure out where I'm going to parole to. Before I got locked up, I was living at that chick's house that I got wrapped up with. My parents both died and my brothers live out of state, which is against the rules. My only option at this point is to parole homeless. Victoria thought about it for a minute, then smiled tenderly. Why in the world would you parole homeless when I have a house with five bedrooms? Really? She sighed. I finally had the opportunity to give someone a second chance like I got. What you think your husband will say? What can he say? I mean, I'll just tell him that I met you through church. And I'm renting out one of our rooms to you. In return, you could help around the house. I could actually use it. Sisko smiled widely. If I could get up right now and give you a giant hug, I would. And listen, it would only be temporary, okay? Just until I get on my feet again. Victoria was so driven by loneliness and virtue that impulse overrode her clear thinking. You can stay as long as you need to. Remember the saying in the book of Peter? Open your homes to each other without complaining. After his visit, Sisko sat with Looney on some metal bleachers next to the outdoor weight pile. He kept a close eye on the yard as they spoke. Well, it looks like you hit the lottery, Carnal. Just don't get so comfortable up in Sunny Hills and States that you forget about the old neighborhood, Looney said. Now, Holmes, don't you see? What's good for one is good for all. This is finally the opportunity we've been waiting for. I just gotta watch my back in the meantime. I wouldn't put it past one of these putos in here to try something stupid before I leave. You've never let me down, Looney uttered. And I never will. My word's my bond. Northsiders for life, Esse, Sisko said as he shook Looney's hand. On the day of his release, Sisko walked past cell house three as he headed to the property room carrying the duffel bag filled with his belongings. He looked up and saw Looney staring through the bars on his cell window. Sisko sat his bag down, pounded his chest and flashed an end sign with his fingers. Looney also pounded his chest and flashed him back in solidarity. A while later, Victoria pulled up in the prison's parking lot in her new Lincoln Navigator. Holy shit, Sisko whispered under his breath as he picked up his bag and headed towards the gate. Victoria got out and gave him a hug. You can throw your stuff in the back, she said. Before he could grab onto the vehicle's tailgate, it began opening on its own. He stood back and watched in amazement. He sat down next to her in the passenger seat. He wore his dress outs, which consisted of a white t-shirt, tan khaki pants, and white sneakers. With his arms now showing, Victoria got her first glimpse of his tattoos. She grinned with curiosity as she looked them over. Wow, I had no idea you had this many tattoos. Sisko's arms were covered in tattoos, many of which were gang-related. On one arm, there was a woman smiling seductively while brandishing pistols in both of her hands, a pair of dice, laughing and crying clown faces, and spider webs surrounding his elbow. The other arm was covered with several skulls, a crown, a time clock, and the words loyalty and Southside Killer in Old English. I've been looking into this one program that offers free tattoo removal for ex-cons. Sounds like a great opportunity, Victoria replied. I've pretty much changed my ways, and that lasts behind me now. Victoria turned into her wraparound driveway and pulled up to a large, newly constructed home. Sisko exited the vehicle with his senses still processing the outside world. 
He followed her through the garage and into the kitchen. When he got inside, he sat his bag down, closed his eyes, and took a giant whiff of the air. The pleasant smell of beef stew mixed with potpourri filled his nostrils. Kenny! Kenny! Victoria called out. Cisco soon heard the sound of a motorized wheelchair approaching. Kenny drove up and parked near the edge of the kitchen. And this is our new house guest, Cisco. Cisco walked over to Kenny and extended his hand. Nice to meet you. Kenny just stared up at him apprehensively. Uh, his arms don't always work, Victoria said. I can answer for myself, Kenny barked. So, what's with all the tattoos? You a thug or something? Cisco grinned awkwardly and glanced over at Victoria. Former gang member, sir. Like I was telling your wife on the car ride over here, I'm actually looking into getting them lasered off. Kenny stayed silent with his tongue hanging out of the side of his mouth, a condition brought on by his traumatic brain injury. Well, you probably want to get settled in, so if you want to grab your stuff, I'll show you to your room. Cisco nodded and grabbed his duffel bag. He followed Victoria through her home as his eyes carefully scanned every inch of the house. A fluffy gray and white cat sat perched on the headrest of their couch. That's Louie. He's a rescue cat, so he's a little skittish. We think he may have been abused. They walked past the sunroom that contained an in-ground spa. That's Kenny's therapy spa. I help him to get inside it and he just kind of flops his arms around. His doctor recommended it to help prevent muscle wasting. They turned the corner which led into the hallway. Victoria then pointed. There's a bathroom here, and the next room over is yours. Cisco's wide-eyed expression was reminiscent of a surveyor who just stumbled upon a large oil reserve. I'll give you some time to unpack and be back in a bit for the rest of the tour. Cisco turned the handle and opened the door that led into his room. The inside was impeccable. The bed was made with care and a cherry oak wood dresser with a large mirror affixed to it sat directly across from it. He lugged his bag inside the room, propping it against the dresser. A Bible verse was taped to the mirror. He bent down and examined it. It read, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. He just scoffed at it and stood back up. Suddenly, an elephant's trumpet could be heard. Sisko turned his head and curiously followed the noise out into the hallway. It seemed to be coming from a room that was catty corner to his. He looked around and walked up to the room's doorway. The door, which was open, led into a room that was filled with safari decor. There were tribal masks and exotic taxidermy animal heads that were mounted on the wall. He stood near the doorway's threshold, peering inside. I see you discovered Kenny's den, Victoria said softly as she walked up from behind. Sisko jerked his head towards her voice. Sorry, I just heard some noises coming from in here. That's his safari clock. I got it for him as a gift a few years back. It makes animal noises on the hour. Before his accident, we had taken a few trips to Africa and kind of fell in love with the continent. Sisko leaned against the doorway. He looked around and nodded. Very interesting. He then turned to Victoria and grinned. I grew up in the hood, so I ain't never seen stuff like this except maybe on TV. Then he sighed. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this whole thing, honestly. Victoria looked deeply in his eyes. If I can help you see that there's more to life than drugs and gangs, then I've done what the good Lord commands us as Christians to do for one another, and maybe one day you'll be the one giving someone else a glimpse of hope and prosperity. Sisko smiled with humility. Amen to that, he said as he hugged her. Well, do you want to see the rest of the house? Yeah, Sisko said enthusiastically. The two continued down the hallway. They walked past her and Kenny's bedroom as well as two other guest rooms. Two French doors led out to a backyard. A large detached garage sat about 70 feet from the house. Victoria looked out towards the structure. I don't know why he had that thing built. What's in there? 
Victoria lowered her voice. It's just a giant garage filled with tools that he can't even use. She sighed. I think he holds out hope that he'll get better eventually, but... She shook her head dejectedly. It's only getting worse. Well, whatever I can do to help, I will. Maybe tonight, if he's okay with it, you can help me get him in the spa for his exercises. Cisco nodded. Sure. He does require a lot of assistance. I have to feed him, bathe him, help him on and off the toilet, and when he gets in and out of the spa. Cisco paused. Did you need my help with, like, the bathing and everything? Because I don't think he'd be cool with that. Victoria laughed. <laughs> no, no, I promise you won't have to give my husband a sponge bath, okay? Cisco chuckled. Okay, good. Nothing against your husband or anything, but... Victoria continued grinning. I totally get it. Do you mind if I get some water? Cisco asked. Oh, sure. Are you hungry? I think we have some leftovers in the fridge. Just some water's fine. Me and some of the homies had a giant spread before I left this morning. As they made their way into the kitchen, she noticed Cisco's free government phone that was sitting on the counter. Oh, I almost forgot. Your phone came the other day. She said as she reached to pick it up. Oh la la, he said as he took it from her. I gotta remember how to use one of these now. It's been a while. 7500 is the code to unlock it. I set it up for you using all the info you gave me. Cisco smiled graciously. Man, Victoria, I really appreciate you doing all this for me. This phone's gonna help me get a job and hopefully reconnect with my son eventually. Victoria smiled. Good things come to good people. Later that evening, they sat around the dining room table eating supper. Victoria spooned beef stew into Kenny's mouth. A towel bib that was draped over his chest acted to catch the dribble that leaked from his lips. This is very tasty. It's the first home-cooked meal I've had in over six years. Victoria chuckled to herself. I still remember the first meal I had in jail. It was pizza day. The dough was still raw, and the cheese was all crusty and dried out. She shook her head as she recollected. Man, that was terrible. What landed you in prison? Kenny asked. Cisco paused for a moment. Just poor choices. I think a lot of it was I didn't have a dad to whoop my ass growing up like I needed. Gangs prey on that. I needed someone to look up to, and unfortunately, it was the wrong people. Victoria stared at him with sadness in her eyes. That's just heartbreaking. I kind of had a rough childhood too, but at least I had parents to give me some sort of guidance. After Cisco finished eating, he retreated to his room. Kenny turned to Victoria. He talks a good game, but there's just something I don't trust about him. Victoria sighed. Kenny, give him a chance. People like that are just like us. They've just been through a lot. It forces them to become harder. After Victoria finished doing the dishes, she sat watching Cisco as he helped Kenny exercise in their spa. It warmed her heart to observe the patience and attention that he showed her husband, and it was nice to finally have some company in their home. After everyone went to bed, Cisco sat outside on the patio. He took out his phone and brought up his contacts. He scrolled down to Smokey and dialed his number. Hey, fool, it's Cisco. I'm finally out, he said, keeping his voice low. He grinned as he heard Smokey's familiar voice come over the other end. Oh, shit. What's up, carnal? We were just talking about you the other day. Where you at? Listen, Holmes, you're not going to believe this shit. I met this whipped up through one of the pin pal services when I was in the joint. I paroled to our house up here in Cheyenne Mountain. Smokey busted up laughing, thinking that it was a joke. No, really? Her husband got in this car accident and got like a huge settlement. This fool's in a wheelchair. Smokey's laughter was soon silenced by the conviction in Cisco's voice. You serious, dog? He said as his demeanor quickly shifted to that of intrigue. I put that on everything. 
I just need a ride so I can get my shit out of storage. I got you, homie. Do you want me to come scoop you up tomorrow? Simone. The next day, the booming sound of smoky subwoofers cut through the afternoon air as he pulled up in his 64 Impala. Cisco parted the blinds and smiled. What's up, Carnal? Smokey exclaimed as he got out and shook Cisco's hand. It's been too long, homie. It's good to be back, Cisco replied. Smokey then turned toward the house, lowered his locs, and motioned with his head. I just gotta know one thing. How the fuck you manage this? Cisco grinned proudly. I guess every dog has his day, he gloated. After Cisco got his belongings out of storage, he changed clothes at Smokey's house. He now sported a crisp white t-shirt, creased up dickies, Nike Cortezes, and a red folded bandana that he wore around his forehead. Smokey dropped him off at Victoria's house later that night. He walked inside carrying several large trash bags full of clothes. Wow, you were gone for a while, Victoria said. My homeboy Smokey drove me to get some of my stuff out of storage. When he walked past Victoria, she could smell the stench of marijuana on him. A few minutes later, she knocked on his door. I know what that smell is. If you want to stay here, please don't come into my home smelling like that again. She then turned and walked off. The next morning, Cisco approached her in the kitchen. Victoria... Listen, I'm sorry about last night, he sighed. This transition's just been hard for me, and I just wanted to celebrate with some friends. But I want you to know that I would never do anything to disrespect you or your home. Thank you, and I recognize the struggles that you face. I faced them too. Tomorrow I'm going to church in the morning. You're welcome to come if you'd like to. Sunday morning. Cisco woke up early to the unpleasant beeping noise of his clear prison-issued alarm clock. After a shower, he stood in front of the mirror, buttoning up his red flannel shirt and slicking back his hair. He sat next to Victoria in the pew as the priest delivered his sermon. He appeared restless and disengaged, but always made sure to crack a smile when she would glance over at him. During worship, he sluggishly clapped his hands to the music. Following prayer service, Victoria introduced him to some of the members of the congregation. Hello, Father Murphy. This is Francisco. He was the one I was telling you about that I met through the pen pal service here at the church. Father Murphy smiled. Welcome, my son. I'm glad you could make it this morning, he said as he shook Cisco's hand. Thank you. It was a really good service, Father, Cisco replied. Victoria told me that you're also a believer. Cisco's eyes fluttered disingenuously. Oh, absolutely. Father Murphy clasped his hands together. Some of the congregation was going to meet for breakfast this morning. Would you both like to come? Victoria turned and looked at Cisco. Oh, I'd really like to, but I gotta finish getting the rest of my stuff out of storage. My friend offered to help me today. Father Murphy smiled warmly. I see. I'm sure you've been busy as you get reestablished. Cisco grinned. Busier than you know. That afternoon, Cisco sat on Smokey's porch, taking a swig off a of 40 as they discussed business. A Chicano rap song played softly in the background. Things have changed since you've been down, Holmes. Glahuda just picked up Tilo a few weeks ago. The feds have been doing raids and undercover stings. The block's hot right now, and it's got a lot of the homies spooked, Smokey said. We need to relocate operations, explore virgin territory. It's the only way we're going to survive. Cisco then smiled cunningly. I think I've got a plan. They pulled up in Victoria's driveway a few hours later. They each grabbed several cardboard boxes that were sitting in the trunk of Smokey's car. The boxes were filled to the brim with a variety of different street drugs and narcotics. There were bricks of heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamines, along with plastic bags that contained different prescription medications that were packed neatly inside. 
Kenny was watching TV as they made their way through the living room. Hey, Kenny, this is Smokey. He's just helping me move some of my stuff. Kenny stayed silent. As they made their way back towards the garage, he was waiting for them in the walkway. Your name's Smokey? The two men stopped and Smokey looked down at them. Yeah, that's right. That's your birth name, Kenny asked sarcastically. Smokey grinned and glanced over at Cisco, then looked back down at Kenny as he removed his locs. That's the name I go by to those close to me. My government name's Emilio, if that's what you're asking. Thank you. I'd just like to know who's entering my home, Kenny said as he turned and glared at Cisco. Smokey smiled and put his locs back on. Not a problem. After they moved the rest of the boxes inside Cisco's room, he opened his closet and stared up at the ceiling towards the attic door. He pulled on its chain and a fold-out staircase slowly lowered itself down. He climbed up on the first step and Smokey began handing him the boxes as he carefully placed each inside the opening. Perfect, homie, Cisco said. Now I can pack whatever we need for the day inside my backpack and we can just divvy it out. If the feds do any more raids in the neighborhood, they ain't gonna find shit. Simon, Smokey said with a smile as he shook Cisco's hand. After Smokey left, Cisco wasted no time and began transferring the drugs into plastic baggies. Bathroom! Bathroom! Kenny's cries for assistance echoed through the house. Cisco? Victoria shouted. Can you help me with Kenny? Fuck. Cisco hissed under his breath. Be right there. He quickly hid his drug paraphernalia in the closet. Kenny sat hunched over on the toilet. I thought I'd show you how to pick him up, Victoria said to Cisco. Okay, Cisco said, nodding. Victoria stood in front of Kenny. She grabbed him under the arms and pulled him into her body. She bent her knees and hoisted him to his feet, then slowly guided him into his chair. Just pretend you're lifting up a warm sack of meat, because it's about the same consistency, Kenny joked. Next time he needs help, do you want to try? Oh, yeah. I'll do whatever I can to listen for him when he yells, Cisco replied. It was near sundown. Man, I got this puto all yelling for me now like I'm his fucking servant, Cisco said as he took a drag off his blunt. Damn, I missed this shit, <laughs> he said as he choked on the smoke. They drove through the south side with the top down on the Impala. Heavy in the game by Tupac rattled the car's trunk and announced their presence as they slowly crept through the neighborhood of a man that they planned to rob. Okay, I think this is that fool's house. I remember the fucked up fence, Smokey said as he pulled up beside the curb and parked. This fool ripped off Tilo a while back, so now we come and collect. They both got out and looked around. A pistol that was concealed underneath Cisco's red and black flannel rested snugly in his waistband. Smokey knocked on the rickety aluminum storm door as Cisco stood behind him, keeping watch. Pretty soon, an unkempt Hispanic man and a wife beater answered the door. What's up, Mario? Smokey said as if he was greeting a long-lost friend. Mario smiled and shook his hand. This is my homeboy Cisco, he said as he introduced the two. As they walked inside, the smell of dirty diapers and rotten trash filled the living room. A painting of the Virgin Mary hung on the wall. Who's all here? Smokey asked. Just me right now. My homeboy Cisco just got released the other day, and we was looking for some yayo to celebrate with. Yeah, fool, I got you. Just give me a minute. Mario turned to walk away. You guys can sit down on the couch if you want to. Smokey suddenly pulled his pistol from his waistband and quickly rushed him from behind. Nah, I'd rather stand, he said as he placed the gun to Mario's head. Cisco pulled out his weapon and aimed it in their direction. What the fuck, fool? Remember when you robbed Tilo? No, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Smokey turned to Cisco. This homie's got amnesia now. You believe that shit? He then pistol whipped Mario in the head. Uh, I ain't fucking playing. The screams of an infant could be heard coming from another room. Okay, okay, please, Holmes. I got a kid. 
Mario led Smokey and Cisco into his bedroom. And don't try any dumb shit either, Smokey barked. He opened his dresser drawer and pulled out a large Ziploc bag full of cocaine. Here, this is all I got, he said as tears of humiliation streamed down his face. You sure about that? I swear on my dollar, man. That's everything. Smokey tossed the bag of coke to Cisco, then pistol whipped Mario again, ah! this time knocking him to the ground. Both men then began kicking and stomping on him. After he lost consciousness, Smokey aimed his gun and shot him in the back of the head, execution style. Afterwards, they began ransacking the room. Smokey frantically pulled open drawers using the barrel of his gun to sift through the contents while Sisko searched the closet. Sisko's face soon lit up and he stuck his gun back in his waistband. He pulled out a sawed-off shotgun and a 9mm pistol. Looks like we got ourselves a new shoddy and a pretty little 9. All right, now let's get the fuck out of here, Smokey exclaimed. After they fled the scene, Mario was left lying on the floor in a pool of his own blood. His daughter's cries could still be heard throughout the house. Sisko got in late that evening, and as it approached 3 a.m., he was still awake, coked up and listening to music. Kenny woke up Victoria. He's still up, blasting his music, and it's three in the morning. Victoria sighed groggily. I'll talk to him. No, I'll talk to him, Kenny replied sternly. He squirmed around, trying to get his arms to work so he could boost himself out of bed, but it was no luck. It was never any luck. Victoria got up and helped him to his feet and into his wheelchair. He sat down, burdened with frustration. He drove out into the hallway and stopped in front of Cisco's door. Francisco, he exclaimed. There was no response, so he leaned over and grabbed his reaching device from the side compartment of his wheelchair. He smacked it against the door. Francisco! Victoria watched from the crack in their door, wanting to intervene but allowing her husband to have his say. The music finally lowered and Cisco opened his door. His eyes were so droopy and bloodshot that he looked on the verge of tears. What's up? What's up is that it's three in the morning. I have my physical therapist coming over first thing tomorrow and we're trying to sleep. Cisco eyed him menacingly as if he were about to explode. After a few more seconds, though, the angry expression left his face and his demeanor seemed to change. Yes, sir. I'm kind of a night owl, so I apologize for the noise. I was just getting ready to crash. Kenny nodded and left. The next morning, nothing was spoke of the incident, but after a few more weeks of Cisco leaving in the afternoon and getting in late in the evening, Victoria finally approached him. How's the job market looking? Cisco sighed. I've been looking every day, but it's hard when you're a felon. People look at you like you're going to rob the place, not ask for work. Smokey told me his cousin might have some construction gigs lined up for us pretty soon, though. Victoria thought about it for a minute. Well, that'd be good. I mean, not that we mind having you around the house or anything, but finding work is the first step towards stability. I hear that. I'm willing to do whatever I can so that I can save up and eventually get a place for me and my son. But despite Cisco's words, this daily pattern continued, and whenever her or Kenny would ask him about it, he always had a setback or excuse. One day, he received a phone call from Looney. What's up, primo? It's Looney. I finally put up to my sister's house. Simone, I'm proud of you, big homie. You made it out of that place. Now it's time to celebrate. There's been a lot happening and we need you. Looney had a hardened look in his eyes. You know where I stand, Holmes. Just tell me what you need and consider it done. Cisco! The hallway reverberated with Victoria's cries for help. Kenny had fallen off the toilet and she struggled to get him back into his chair. Cisco walked into the bathroom and picked him up. She looked at Kenny with distress. Are you okay? Did you hurt yourself? Kenny pulled away from her with a look of embarrassment. I'm fine. You don't need to treat me like a goddamn invalid all the time. 
Sisko followed Victoria into the living room. She sat down on the couch, still visibly shaken. Man, you should have called for me sooner. She sighed. I wish I would have. I'm still not used to having someone else around. She held out her hands, which were trembling. Look, I'm still shaking. Hold on a minute, Sisko said as he got up and walked to his room. He returned a few minutes later holding two white pills. He held out his hand. Here, they're for anxiety. It looks like you could use them right about now. Victoria looked up at him, shaking her head. Oh, I really don't like taking pills or anything. I don't like taking anything either, but they're really mild. It just takes the edge off things. Sisko went into the kitchen and brought her back a glass of water. Victoria thought about it for a minute. She sighed and took the pills in her hand. She hesitated, then nervously placed them in her mouth and washed them down with a giant gulp of water. Unbeknownst to her, however, these weren't anxiety pills. They were Vicodin. A little while later, Sisko checked on her. How you feeling? Victoria sat peeled to the couch. A lot better. She grinned. It's been a long time since I felt this relaxed. Sisko smiled darkly and nodded. Good. He then paused. I have more if you need them. Victoria's unhappiness coupled with her addictive nature would eventually lead to her taking Sisko up on his offer, and she soon began self-medicating with the Vicodin on a regular basis. As the weeks passed, her dependence on them increased and her personality began to change. She was often tired and disoriented, which led her to neglect her duties as a caregiver. She lay asleep in her bed while Kenny sat in his wheelchair across from her, drenched in his own urine and trying to wake her. Victoria! he yelled. Victoria! She slowly opened her eyes. I need my pants changed. I had an accident. She sat up semi-consciously. It's after 11 o'clock. You missed church. What's going on with you? She just rubbed her eyes. Mm, come on. She said as she began removing his pants. It looks like a damn lowrider convention out there. I know you wanted to help out, but this is getting out of hand. When did you say he's leaving again? Kenny asked as he peered out the window. Parked outside in the driveway was Smokey's Impala. Looney bounced up and down obnoxiously as he hit the switches in his Monte Carlo. Not bad for sitting for almost two years. Looney said with an amused grin. Easy, Holmes. You're going to scare all the neighbors, Sisko snickered. A few minutes later, Kenny drove up in his wheelchair. You're going to crack the slab bouncing like that. He then turned to Sisko and attempted to point his gnarled finger at him. And I don't remember giving you permission to have all these cars parked here. Looney got out of his car and walked up to Kenny. I don't know who you think you're talking to, S.A., but you don't gotta get all crazy like that. Sisko put up his arm in front of Looney, then looked down at Kenny. Victoria said it was cool. Victoria says a lot of dumb shit lately, Kenny snapped. He glared up at Sisko. This is my house. Just remember that. Sisko glared back at him, then finally turned and looked at Smokey and Looney. You heard the man. Park your cars on the street. Kenny huffed and drove off. After both men moved their cars, Looney walked back up the driveway and stopped in front of Sisko. Man, fuck that cool little. Sisko's brow wrinkled as he glared toward the house. Kenny went into the bedroom where Victoria lay. I don't want them parking their cars in the driveway anymore, he said sternly. Victoria rolled around in agony, then sat up. Anything else, Dad? Is that what you want me to start calling you? Because you're starting to treat me like I'm a child. Listen. I don't have to listen. Listen. Just because I'm in this damn thing doesn't mean I'm stupid. I know you're on something. You don't know shit. Victoria barked. You think it's easy taking care of you? Why don't you go out there with your friends and bounce in their cars with them? Kenny exclaimed sarcastically as he exited the room. Victoria flung her pillow at him, narrowly missing his head. Maybe I will, you bastard. 
She fell back in bed and covered her face as she began to sob. Later that day, Victoria walked down the grocery store aisle as she hid behind her sunglasses. Victoria? A woman's voice suddenly called out. She turned and saw that it was Cindy, a woman she knew from church. Cindy stopped and turned her cart around. As she got closer, she noticed Victoria's withdrawn demeanor. Are you okay? Victoria forced a smile and nodded. I'm fine. Cindy smiled. We missed you the last few weeks. Me and Father Murphy were just talking about you today. At that moment, Cisco rounded the corner. Cindy turned to him. Her smiling face was met with his forbidden gaze. You ready, Tori? I'll see you, Cindy. Victoria said as she walked away. Take care. I hope to see you at church next week, Cindy said with a look of concern. Victoria soon found herself slipping further into the same dark abyss that had consumed her so many years earlier. She sat with Cisco on his bed one day, looking tired and strung out. I just need a couple more to get me through the night, she begged him. I already told you I'm out but I'm going to get more. She buried her head in her hands. Please, I'm just having a rough day. She began rocking back and forth. After all I've done for you. Cisco looked away dismissively. Victoria got up and began digging through his dresser drawers. Where is it? Where do you keep them hidden? I don't got no more. Victoria began to get loud. Don't lie to me. Kenny heard the commotion and pounded on the door with his reaching device. What the hell's going on in there? He's got drugs in here and he's been lying to me. Victoria shouted as she flung open the door. That's it, Kenny pointed at Cisco. You need to get the hell out of my house and you need to check yourself into rehab, he said, looking at Victoria. Cisco jumped to his feet. Or what? Victoria paused. Cisco walked up to Kenny and glared down at him. What your crippled ass gonna do, huh? Kenny peered up at him, fuming. You've got 24 hours to get your shit and get out, or else I'm calling the cops. Cisco spent the rest of the day stewing on Kenny's ultimatum. He knew he had to act, and he began to think of ways to murder him while making it appear as an accident, so that Victoria could inherit his assets. He decided to wait until she left the house and then drown him. He would explain that Kenny was feeling stiff and asked to get into the hot tub. He would then say that he had to step away for a minute, and when he returned, Kenny was lying face first in the water. It seemed believable, and it would appear as if it was just a horrible accident. Cisco bided his time, and when Victoria went to the grocery store the next day, he emerged from his room high on methamphetamines and determined to end Kenny's life. Kenny sat in the living room watching TV as Cisco passed by him and walked into the kitchen. He peered through the blinds to make sure that Victoria was gone. He then walked over to the hot tub and opened the cover. He walked back into the living room and crept up on Kenny from behind, placing him in a chokehold. A struggle ensued. Kenny choked and gagged as Cisco attempted to pull him out of his chair, but to Cisco's surprise, he put up more of a fight than he anticipated. Cisco lost his balance and both men fell to the floor. Kenny's eyes bulged out of his head and his fingernails dug into Cisco's wrist. Cisco's eyes were filled with madness and his senses were numbed by the drug-induced adrenaline rush that surged through his body. He clamped down tighter on Kenny's neck cutting off his air supply and causing the blood vessels in his head to burst. Soon, blackness began to encompass his vision as the life drained from his body. Cisco released his grip and quickly got to his feet. Fuck! He shouted hysterically. At that moment, the gravity of the situation became all too real. Kenny wasn't supposed to die like this. Thoughts of going back to prison raced through his mind. He began trying to think up an excuse to tell Victoria. The hot tub scenario seemed too far-fetched. He paced around the house nervously when he noticed a bottle of peanut butter that was sitting on the kitchen counter. He then conceived the only logical alibi that his panicked mind could formulate. 
Cisco picked up his phone and dialed Victoria's number. Dory, listen, you need to come home. Kenny choked on his food. Victoria got a puzzled look on her face. Well, is he all right? Cisco paused. You just need to come home. Victoria left her shopping cart in the middle of the aisle and bolted out of the store. When she got home, Cisco met her in the middle of the driveway. Is Kenny okay? Victoria exclaimed as she jumped out of her vehicle. There was an accident. Kenny was eating and he started choking on his food. Where's he at? He's in the living room. Victoria darted into the house. She walked through the kitchen and saw Kenny sprawled out on the living room floor. Kenny! She shouted as she ran towards him. She knelt down next to him and checked for a pulse as tears streamed down her face. Did you call 911? Cisco walked into the room. No! No, we can't call the cops! Victoria began frantically administering chest compressions to Kenny's lifeless body. What are you talking about? You need to call an ambulance! Look at me, I'm an ex-felon! The first thing cops are going to try and do is pin this on me somehow! What are you talking about? Victoria exclaimed. She finally stopped doing compressions and laid on Kenny's chest as she wept. Something's not right here. This doesn't make any sense. It's like I told you. He wanted a peanut butter sandwich, so I made him one. I cut it up and fed him in a few bites. I went into the other room for a minute, and when I came back in here, he was choking. I tried to save him, but it was too late. Victoria rose to her feet. I'm calling the police. Cisco grabbed her wrist. <clears throat> Listen to me, he said, scowling. You ain't calling no one. I'm not taking any chances. I'll take care of this, all right? You know I got drugs in the house. The last thing we need is cops nosing around here. You're part of this too now, whether you like it or not. Your only job now is to keep your mouth shut. Understand? In that moment, a mix of fear, grief, and confusion overwhelmed Victoria. A tear rolled down her cheek and she nodded obediently. Cisco then reached into his pocket and pulled out two tablets of Vicodin, placing them in her hand. He smiled and gently kissed her on the lips. Good girl. He released her from his grip and she walked out of the room sniveling. He then picked up his phone and dialed Smokey's number. Hey, listen. You and Looney need to get over here right away. Some shit went down. A while later, he saw Smokey pull up in the driveway as he parted the blinds with the barrel of his pistol. Smokey and Looney got out and sprinted toward the house. Sisko opened the door as they both shook his hand and stepped inside. Smokey raised up his looks. What's up, Vato? You good? We got a problem, Sisko said. He then pointed at Kenny's body on the floor. Smokey turned his head to look. Oh, shit. Is he dead? Looney walked up to him with his arms crossed and peered down at him. Sisko lowered his voice so that Victoria wouldn't hear. I fucked up. I was gonna drown him and make it look like an accident, but the fucker was squirming too much and I guess I was too rough. I gotta get rid of him. Smokey thought about it for a minute. We could bury him somewhere out here in the mountains. Looney, who had been quiet up until that moment, finally interjected. I said... It's the only way to get rid of him without a trace. If we bury him, there's a chance an animal could dig him up. Where the fuck are we gonna get acid from? Cisco asked. From the hardware store, fool. They sell it in gallon containers. Cisco thought about it for a minute. That's actually a good idea. Let's get him out of here before we leave, though. You got a blanket or something to wrap him up in? Smokey asked. Let me look around, Cisco replied. He rummaged through the garage when he came across a folded up tarp that was sitting under some boxes. He took it back inside and laid it on the ground next to Kenny's body. The men then placed him on the tarp and rolled him up inside it. They carried him through the house and placed him out in the garage. Before they left, Sisko knocked on Victoria's bathroom door. She cracked it open. Here, drink this, he said, handing her a shot glass. I don't want to. Victoria replied sheepishly. Just drink it. It'll calm you down. 
Victoria reluctantly drank the mixture, which was vodka laced with chloral hydrate, a powerful sedative. I gotta run to the store real quick. Looney trudged down the aisle of the hardware store and grabbed a large bottle of sulfuric acid off the shelf. Cisco backed Victoria's navigator up to the dock as an associate loaded an oversized plastic drum into the back of it. They picked up Looney in the parking lot and drove back to the house. Should we do this in the garage? Cisco asked Looney. You wouldn't even be able to walk out here with the fumes. It's gotta be outside somewhere. How about the back patio? Looney nodded. That should work. They grabbed the plastic drum out of the back of the navigator and carried it to the backyard. Looney poured the bottle of acid into it. He then turned on the garden hose and filled it halfway up with water. They carried Kenny's corpse through the house and into the backyard. They unwrapped him and carefully lowered his body into the solution, which bubbled and swirled around erratically inside the drum. Once he was submerged, a yellowish froth quickly formed, and the acid began to boil as it went to work vanquishing his body like a hungry school of piranha. Looney placed the lid on top. I'll check on him in the morning. As afternoon turned to dusk, the weather began to change. An unexpected dip in the jet stream brought storm clouds in from the east. Looney pulled Smokey's Impala into the detached garage. He raised it off the ground with a floor jack and slid underneath it to check out a leak in the car's hydraulics. Cisco and Smokey sat in the living room smoking weed and doing lines of coke off the coffee table. Smokey took a giant bump, then dropped his straw and began coughing. Cisco stood up grinning. Damn fool, I think you sniffed the finish off the table. He then motioned with his head. I'm gonna go check on homegirl. He walked into Victoria's bedroom and saw her passed out on the bed. He turned on the lamp and sat down next to her. He caressed her face and bent over to kiss her on the forehead. Don't worry, I'm gonna take good care of you. Lightning lit up the night sky as it flashed behind the clouds and the storm outside intensified. The wind howled and the raindrops began to bead on the windows. Looney slid out from underneath Smokey's car. He walked over to Cisco's boombox and turned on the radio. Waking the dead by suicidal tendencies blasted from the speakers like a sinister symphony. He grabbed a wrench set then crawled back under the car. A few minutes later a loud pop could be heard outside, followed by the sound of crashing thunder. Sparks sprayed from a transformer that had been struck by lightning. The power to the house and garage suddenly went out, leaving the men draped in darkness. Fuck! Looney exclaimed, who was in the middle of removing one of the hoses from the car's undercarriage. Sisko made his way back into the living room where Smokey was. Chingao! Did you hear that shit? Is there a flashlight in here? Smokey asked. Cisco used his cell phone light to dig through the cupboard as he searched for a flashlight. Moments later, another bolt of lightning flashed through the sky, striking the plastic drum that contained Kenny's remains. The house shook, causing Cisco to jump. What the fuck? He ran to the window and looked outside. Did that shit hit the house? He said as he jerked his head towards Smokey. I don't know, man, but I can't handle this shit right now. I didn't see a flashlight. Is Looney still in the back? As far as I know. Victoria finally came to and wandered into the living room. What was that noise? She mumbled incoherently. Cisco pointed the light from his cell phone towards her. Here, I'm gonna get your tipsy ass back to the bedroom before you trip over something, he said, walking towards her. The plastic drum was left smoldering and laying on its side. Electrical current flowed through Kenny's mangled and partially deteriorated corpse. His clothes had been fully dissolved, and smoke rose from what was left of his body tissue. He now barely resembled anything human. He was missing his left leg. His right leg remained intact, but only above the knee. His left hand was gone 
and his other arm had been reduced to a mutilated stump. His face and hair were melted off, leaving behind two empty eye sockets, a mouth, and a nasal cavity. Then, in an unexplainable scene that defied both science and logic, Kenny's appendages began to slowly twitch. Soon, his right leg moved. Driven by whatever supernatural force was present in the thunderstorm, he pulled himself from the plastic drum that had once entombed his defiled body. The motor function in his limbs was now fully restored and provided him with strength beyond that of what any mortal man could ever possess. He drug himself towards the detached garage as chunks of flesh and muscle fell off his bones and his internal organs spewed from his diaphragm. Looney used his cell phone light as he continued working on Smokey's car. Kenny reached the garage and slid through the opening under the door. Looney paused what he was doing and aimed his light at a noise he heard. Although somewhat dim, it provided enough brightness to illuminate the inside. He swept it from side to side but didn't see anything. He cranked down hard on the car's hose, finally prying it free, when his eyes detected what looked like movement off in the distance. He pointed his light toward the motion, but the object in question was a weed whacker that rocked back and forth on the wall that it hung from. Convinced it was due to a draft from the outside air, he once again turned his eyes back to his work. Kenny crawled in front of the car, finally lurching into frame. Looney jerked his light to look as a feeling of terror completely overtook him. Kenny's grotesque features cast a nightmarish shadow on the wall behind them. Before Looney had a chance to react, Kenny swung his arm at the floor jack, striking it and causing it to tip over on its side. The car crashed down violently onto Looney's chest, sending his intestines squirting through his abdominal wall and expelling his brains onto the car's oil pan. Inside the house, Sisko took off his shirt and began kissing Victoria, who lay on her bed submissively. Smokey lay awake in one of the spare bedrooms a few doors down looking at his phone when he heard something brushing against the door. Hey, fool, is that you? He called out, initially believing that it was Sisko messing around. There was no answer. He then heard it again, slower and more distinctly this time. He turned on his cell phone's flashlight and grabbed the pistol off the table. He crept towards the door as an uneasy feeling came over him. He swung it open and aimed his gun as his light cut through the darkness in the empty hallway. The air seemed to thicken with an unearthly ambience. As he walked down the hall, he could hear moaning sounds coming from Victoria's bedroom. As he entered the dining room, he saw a window that was propped halfway open, and a trail of mud mixed with leaves and debris that was smeared on the floor in front of it. He looked around in confusion. Looney! Hey, this ain't funny, motherfucker! Quit playing! He closed the window, then followed the trail of mud until it finally disappeared into the hallway. He then began to search the house for an intruder. He opened the door to the safari room and cautiously stepped inside. The taxidermied animal heads that hung on the wall were concealed by the darkness. Lightning suddenly flashed through the window, illuminating their menacing expressions as they seemed to scowl at him from every corner of the room. The clock then suddenly chimed, triggering the sound of a lion's roar. <coughs> Smokey jumped back, hitting the shelf behind him and causing some books that were sitting on it to go flying into the air. He quickly retreated out of the room and ran back into the bedroom he was in earlier. He locked the door in a panic and sat down on the edge of the bed. He tapped his foot nervously and tightly gripped his pistol as he tried to get a hold of himself. To his horror, he heard the noise again, only this time it sounded like it was coming from under the bed. 
His face grimaced, and he reluctantly crouched down onto the floor. He aimed his cell phone light and began to slowly lift up the blanket. A primitive fear that he hadn't experienced since childhood completely overtook his senses, and his gun trembled in his hand. As he moved closer, Kenny's dark, deformed figure was suddenly illuminated by his light. He lunged forward, sinking what was left of his decayed teeth into Smokey's throat. Smokey fired his gun as Kenny viciously ripped out his larynx, rendering him unable to scream and choking on his own blood. He managed to get off another shot before losing consciousness, blowing Kenny's shoulder blade off. Sisko heard the gunshots and jumped off Victoria. He put on his boxers, then grabbed his weapon and fumbled for his phone. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck's going on, but stay here, he shouted. He gripped his pistol in a ready position as he scrambled down the hallway and began frantically searching each room. He shined his light in the bedroom where Smokey was murdered. His blood-soaked body lay sprawled out next to the bed with his neck torn open and a look of terror frozen on his face. Sisko's eyes got big, and a feeling of consternation paralyzed him. <laughs> Dios mio, what the fuck? He said, terror-stricken and stumbling back into the hallway. He ran into his room and threw on some clothes, then darted through the backyard to the detached garage. Looney! He shouted hysterically. He could see Looney's legs sticking out from under the car, but was still too far away to make out the gruesome details. As he got closer, though, he could see a trail of blood that ran from under the car. And when he finally processed what had happened, he stopped dead in his tracks. A nauseated feeling caused him to turn away as he bent over and began heaving, then spit up on the floor. He stood back up and wiped the vomit from his mouth then scowled. Peachy Southsiders! Bitch-ass motherfuckers! He shouted as a tear ran down his face. He rationalized that it must have been a ruthless gang hit, maybe retaliation for killing Mario. It was the only explanation for what had happened that his mind could comprehend. Fearing that he might be next, he ran as fast as he could back to the house. <laughs> we gotta get the fuck out of here! He shouted at Victoria. What's happening? She whimpered fearfully. I'll tell you later. Now come on, we gotta go now. Cisco peeled out of the driveway in Victoria's Lincoln Navigator and fishtailed into the street. Cisco, we need to call the police and end this. This is insane. Cisco turned and scowled menacingly at Victoria. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. Tears began to stream down his face and he held the pistol up to his temple. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but both of my closest homies are dead. Your husband's dead, and there's drugs in the house. So no, we're not calling the fucking cops, okay? He seemed to be on the verge of a complete mental breakdown. Victoria remained quiet, fearing it was her only chance for survival. He hid out at Smokey's house for the next few days, holding Victoria hostage as he smoked meth and geared up for what he envisioned may turn into a full-scale gang war. After enduring a brief withdrawal period from the prescription pain pills, Victoria finally regained some mental clarity. She passed the time praying and reciting Bible verses to herself. On the third day, Sisko made up his mind to go back to the house and get the drugs that he had hidden in the ceiling. He didn't have any more chloral hydrate to sedate Victoria with, so he forced her into the vehicle with him. He circled the block a few times to check for any activity at the house, then pulled into the driveway and parked. He pointed his pistol at Victoria. I need to grab some shit. If you even think of trying anything, I'll fucking kill you, he said with a cold and intimidating gaze. This was the first time that he had ever pointed his weapon at her. She sat in her seat, frozen with fear. He aimed his pistol and swung open the front door, then slowly entered. He cautiously crept through the house, and when he was sure that the coast was clear, he gathered speed and sprinted down the hallway to his room. 
He opened the attic and climbed up the stairs as he began grabbing the drugs out of the ceiling. Victoria sat silently in her seat, staring in front of her as Sisko began loading the boxes into the SUV's rear compartment. On his next trip through the house, he saw the crawlspace door was propped up, something that he hadn't noticed earlier. He pulled his pistol from his waistband and pointed it at the ceiling. He inched closer as his heart began to race. He stopped a few feet away and listened. Suddenly, a noise could be heard. It sounded like something dragging on the ground. He fired two shots into the opening as the gunfire echoed through the house. Startled by the noise, Victoria got up the courage to jump out of the vehicle and flee to a neighbor's house. The noise that Sisko heard seemed to have ceased. Motivated by curiosity, he stepped closer. He pulled his phone out of his pocket and turned on the flashlight. He then got down onto his hands and knees and carefully lowered himself into the opening. The growing tension that was nearly insurmountable at this point soon resolved when he saw that it was an empty space, littered with several boxes, some rusty nails and a few spools of coax cable. He breathed a sigh of relief, but that relief was short-lived. And before he could lift himself back up, Kenny emerged from hiding in between two floor joists. He jolted forward and bit off Sisko's ear. Sisko shrieked, then lost his balance and fell face first onto the crawlspace floor. His gun flew out of reach and his flashlight now pointed up at the subfloor overhead. He groaned and rolled onto his back in a daze. His nose was broken by the fall and blood gushed from his gnawed off ear. Kenny jumped down on top of him. <laughs> Please! Sisko pleaded, unable to get a clear look at Kenny, whose disfigured body was concealed by the darkness. He put up his hands to try and defend himself as Kenny climbed up his torso. Sisko, a man once hardened by prison and the brutality of gang life, was now reduced to a coward who pleaded for mercy. But this thing that was once Kenny had no concept of mercy or compassion. It only knew punishment and retribution in the most horrific and barbaric way imaginable. Kenny began wildly stabbing his deteriorated radius bone into Sisko's sternum. Carnage was flung everywhere, and you could hear his rib cage crunch with each blow. Blood oozed out of his mouth, and the pain was so unbearable that he lost control of all bodily functions. His chest cavity soon collapsed, and his heart and lungs were left smeared onto the concrete floor below. Kenny then crawled off Sisko's decimated body. Now that the men were all dead, he had fulfilled his ruthless mission. He sat motionless in the corner and the phantom force that had controlled him soon began to drain from his body. A series of small glowing orbs shot out of his chest and ascended into the atmosphere. Kenny's spirit could finally rest now that Victoria was safe and his death was properly avenged. Sisko and his homeboys, on the other hand, had to learn the hard way that the one thing that you never want to do is leave a spirit restless and without closure. If there's enough suffering and discontent, and the forces of nature align with the spirit world, you sometimes risk waking the dead. And that was Waking the Dead by author Brian Asbury. My good reminder that real problems don't tend to just melt away. Sometimes they just melt halfway and end up stabbing you to death with their own bones. Like it says on acid bottles, user discretion advised. A little about the author. Brian Asbury is originally from Pueblo, Colorado. 
He grew up on the steady diet of 90 psychological thrillers, as well as TV shows like Tales from the Crypt and The Twilight Zone. He's a regular contributor for CTFDN, Drew Blood's Dark Tales in particular, giggity, and he's penned eight stories that have been featured on the network so far. One of his lifelong goals has always been to film, and he's excited to report that he's currently in talks with movie executives to adapt his story, The Mariachi Man, into a screenplay. Now that's kick-ass. His books are available on Amazon.com by searching for Brian Asbury under books, as well as BarnesandNoble.com or by simply stopping in select Barnes & Noble locations and searching for his books on the shelf. You can also check out the show notes up there and find the link to this very story on Kindle. I really hope y'all go and give Brian some support. Fans can connect with him on Facebook under Brian Asbury Writer. He'd like to thank his lovely wife Amber, who has been one of his biggest inspirations, and also his family and friends. You know who you are. Hey, thanks, Brian. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. It's kind of a custom around here, but again, user discretion advised. May the wind be at your back. And may the road rise up to meet you. May the sun shine on your face, unless you're Rocky Dennis. And above all, as we're all wont to do from time to time, go fuck yourself. <laughs> good night, dear friends, and good night, my darling patrons. Go to patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood and become a patron. We're having a lot of fun over there.